Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jamie Karboviak, Executive Director of the Ross Landmark Society, and I'd like to thank you for joining us here today at the beautiful Trinity Episcopal Church for the second lecture in our 2024 speaker series. I'd like to take this, um, take a moment to thank Lisa Hendrickson and the Trinity Church staff for partnering with us to bring you this fantastic event. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, the Roslyn Landmark Society was founded in 1961 by Dr. Roger and Peg Gary to protect the historic structures in this area from development. Um, since that time, close to 50 historic structures have been preserved and counting, and we could not accomplish all we do without supporters like you. So thank you, and thank you for being here. If you're a member of our organization, doubly thank you. If you are not yet a member of our organization, I encourage you to check out our website at roslandmarks.org, where you can find much more information about what we do and how to become a member. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, please double check to make sure your cell phones are silenced for the tour. And um, without further delay, I'd like to introduce you to Jean Henning, museum educator and Trinity Church parishioner. Um, Jean? Thank you. Um, we, uh, we will actually be beginning at the back of the church, but just a few moments of introduction. Um, as a longtime parishioner, I am uh, delighted to welcome you to this church. Um, I have spent many, many hours here, and I have to tell you, one of the pleasures of preparing for this talk was to actually discover some new things, which I did not expect. So it's been uh, really a lot of fun to do this. Um, and I would encourage you, if you would like to come back to enjoy the architecture or to look at the windows, uh, we are happy to see you any Sunday morning at 10 o'clock as well. Um, so please, with no further ado, let's go to the back. We're going to start with the older history of the church back there, and then we'll work our way up this way. So follow me. <laughs> okay, um, I'm starting back here because um, the title of this talk was The Gilded Age, uh, but the church has a much older history than that, um, which I personally find really interesting. And I've already had a couple of questions about this bell um, and the gravestone, and it is a wonderful story. Next to Lisa is a picture of the old church. It was a frame church, very modest, built in the 1860s. And um, a young 18 year old uh, man who lived in Roslyn was the Sunday school superintendent. His name was John Codman Pollitz. Uh, the Civil War came along. He immediately enlisted and went off to fight in the Civil War. Um, after he'd been there a very short time, it sent all of his paychecks back to Roslyn to buy a bell for the new church. Um, he died. And the first time the bell tolled was at his funeral. So it's just always been one of these kind of heartbreaking stories. And the bell has been at the back of the church for many years. Now, a few years ago, um, the legend had always been that he was buried somewhere under the church, but nobody knew where. Um, a few years, very few years ago, I think 2018, um, the church floor, there were some cracks, the foundation had to be checked, um, the floor had to be redone. So this whole area where you're standing was taken up. And uh, once the floor was uncovered, this gravestone was found um, under the floor. And a history was found written in 1914 that the same thing had happened um, in 1914, there were some cracks in the foundation, and the then rector of the church had crawled underneath and had discovered this gravestone um, and the bell, which had been buried um, at some point with Codman, and decided to bring the bell up, um, but leave. This was it was all buried because when the old church um, was demolished, um, the new church covered the area where the grave had been. Um, so when he brought the bell up, he left the gravestone under there, and nobody had any idea where it was until the floor was removed. And I remember coming in here, um, our sexton, the caretaker, called me, and he said, we've made this very exciting discovery. Um, we found out 
where the grave is because we'd always heard that it was somewhere here. And he said, we've taken up the stone and the stone is now um, in place next to the bell. And it's just, I mean, to me, it's just a beautiful story. This young man, I mean, he was 19 when he died. Um, you know, all of his savings went to buy this bell for the church that he loved so much. And the first time it told was at his, at his funeral. Um, it was a very touching story. So where his grave is, um, we there was someone who came in to actually do some sort of x-ray work um, and find out that underneath the gravestone, there actually was something that appeared to be a coffin. So someone is probably standing over a brass plaque right there. And that is the location of his grave. This window, the stained glass window, and the one on the far side uh, were both in the older church. And the older church had um, very pointy uh, windows, but more, more Gothic windows. Uh, this church, when it was designed, um, was built with more of a numinous Romanesque design with more arch window. So these windows were actually put into these arch frames. These were the old windows. And here's the colors that are there. Um, I'll just add this a bit to the stained glass, which in that era um, was painted. Um, and this is the big difference between the older glass and the Tiffany glass is that the older glass is painted. Um, and so it's a very different um, way of looking through the glass of the way the light comes through it. And we'll be looking at some more examples of it um, in a few moments. Um, but the story then moves to the person whose name you can see over that door, um, Catherine Dewar Mackey. And um, Catherine Dewar Mackey is a, uh, a wonderful personality, I think, the equal of Stanford White and Tiffany are both connected to this church, but not nearly as well known. Um, she decided that she, um, she has, I think many of you know the story, um, that she and her husband um, an enormous property that she passed away here from her nest. Um, so I will let you know the, um, the, the older church that were put in place there. Um, so any, if anybody wants to walk that way, um, you can take a look at those windows. They're much prettier with the lights off, which is why we left the lights turned off. So go in that way, and I will meet you at the front. Um, I should have mentioned while we were back there, but you can look at it when you go back again. Um, the baptismal font that was sort of in the middle of the space where you were standing uh, was given by Mrs. Mackey um, when the old church was still standing here in 1899. Um, and it was first used at the baptism of the, her oldest child, uh, Catherine. So to get back to the Mackeys, as I said, I think many of you know the story. Uh, of Mrs. Mackey and, um, and her husband, Clarence. Um, she was a beautiful young woman um, from a, a very social uh, New York, very old New York family. Um, her husband, uh, Clarence, was the son of John Mackey. Uh, and I think some of you may also know this. Uh, John Mackey was an Irish immigrant who came to the US, uh, went to California during the gold rush, didn't have much luck with gold, uh, but went to Nevada and had a lot of luck with silver. Um, he discovered the Comstock Lode uh, and became known as the Silver King. Um, with the money from that, he then moved to San Francisco and started a cable company that ultimately rivaled Western Union and made even more money. So there was, you know, endless, I mean, he was in that era, definitely a multi multi-millionaire. Um, he and his wife moved to New York. Uh, I think if you are familiar with the, if you've been watching the, the Gilded Age on television or even Downton, um, you know that it was very hard for new money to infiltrate old New York society. And so it's one of those sort of classic stories 
the Matthews moved to Europe, educated their son there. Um, he came back to New York and met Catherine Matthew. And it was this sort of perfect combination. He fell madly in love with her. She was apparently absolutely beautiful, 18 years old. Um, she was old money, very socially acceptable, and um, but not enough money because she had very extravagant taste. And he had all the money to fulfill that taste. So um, as a wedding present, um, her father-in-law, John Mackey, gave her the 648 acres across the street from across Northern Boulevard from here, um, which is now Roslyn Estates and has what, 1,600 houses on it. Um, yeah, they hired Stanford White, who was at the height of his fame, um, very wealthy, well-known, well-known society architect also, to build a house that rivaled Versailles. Um, huge. I mean, I, there was a wonderful book, which you may have read by Richard Guy Wilson, called Harbor Hill. Um, 150 servants. I mean, it had an indoor tennis court. It had a swimming pool. It had stables. It had a casino, a dairy, um, horses, you know, state. I mean, it, it just, it went on and on. Um, I mean, it was just, it was absolutely extraordinary. So um, Catherine Mackey, once that was built, she was at the age of 19, living in one of the largest homes on Long Island, or probably in the whole country. Um, and I read a wonderful uh, piece that said, one of the greatest hobbies of the wealthy was building. And once the building of Harbor Hill was done, uh, I think she looked around and thought, hmm, all right, now what do I do? And she had been coming to Trinity. Um, and as I said, had given the, given the font. She had also in the old church, given this window behind me, uh, the creation window. Um, which is apparently very unusual in terms of church iconography. Um, God is rarely depicted in a window. Um, and the artist is has always been a subject of debate. Um, I've had many people tell me it, they're pretty sure it's not a Tiffany window, but it is by somebody very good, uh, possibly John Lafarge. So if you know anyone who's looking for a master's or a PhD topic, this window would be a great a great research uh, thesis. Um, so this window had been in the old church. We have photographs of it and was obviously very carefully dismounted and moved um, to this church when it was built. So um, in around 1902, when she had finished at Harbor Hill, she decided that Trinity Church needed to have um, a parish house, which we will visit after this. We're going to do this in a chronologically sort of backwards uh, way. Um, so the parish house was built. Um, she asked Stanford White to design that because of course he'd been working for her. He obviously didn't feel that it was quite up to what he wanted to do. It was a very modest building and his um, chief assistant apparently did design that for him. Um, she then said she would put up sort of a challenge grant to the church and wanted them to raise money to build a proper church. She didn't consider this wooden sort of board and batten church to be appropriate uh, now that she had this brick building as a parish house. And then somewhere along 1906, apparently she got very impatient and decided that she would just give all the money um, for the church. So I have a wonderful quote. Um, she was a great one for writing letters. And she wrote a letter to um, the church vestry um, which said, hold on, if I can find it, not won't be able to find it, but it was wonderful. Um, yes, here we go. In 1905, she said, um, McKim Mead and White will make plans for the, for the construction of a new church for certain alterations to the rectory and for a cloistered passage, which we will also see when we walk up that way. The idea the ideas are to harmonize all of these buildings into a pleasing group. It will cost $45,000 to build uh, this church and make these alterations. So this was her gift to the church. Um, the church in the meantime had raised apparently about $4,000 and that $4,000 went to 
by the marble al altar, which is behind me, um, covered with uh, with cloth now as it's normal for our services. So that was that was the the church and the church when it was completed. Um, the New York Times article in 1914 that discussed the, the covering of, of the bell, the discovering of the bell. So Trinity Church is said to be the most perfect piece of ecclesiastical architecture of its size on Long Island. Um, so obviously considered to be a, a, a lovely, a lovely work of art. And um, I think as you sit here, um, I'd like you to just sort of take in the space, look up. It is um, 80 feet high, which is, I was trying to figure this out. My math, I'm not so great on math, but say an average room is eight feet. So it's, a ten, it's like a 10 story high building. I mean, it's extremely high. The church originally um, was designed to hold 600 people. Um, when, we, when the church did the work on the floor because our parish is considerably smaller, um, many of the pews were removed. And as you can see, some of them were actually made smaller, um, as you can see up here. Um, and it looks, the church looks much smaller from the outside. And when we get outside, I will show you why, because it was a kind of an interesting design trick. So Stanford White um, did not design many churches, um, but he did quite a few in New York. Apparently this one is a very different design from most of his churches. And he used um, an English medieval design um, of which this um, this wooden um, sort of construction, um, which is with hammer beams, which are the the pieces that stick out. And can you see that they have angels on them? They have cherubim heads on the on on each on each one of them. Um, someone had told me many years ago that each one of those angels was carved with a different face. Now my eyes are not good enough to see that. But I did, and I would encourage you, maybe not now, but later, if you have a camera, um, which I did a few weeks ago, um, take out your camera and zoom in on those faces. And yes, indeed, every single one of those faces is different. Um, they're just beautifully carved. Um, and I think, again, Stanford White loved sort of the, the, the work of, of the workmanship of kind of handmade design. Um, along with the fact that he also loved the most modern technology. So you may not find this light fixture to be the most brilliant illumination, um, but this again uh, was for 1906, a pretty remarkable um, way to illuminate a church um, or any building. I mean, it was, I think, quite startling, actually, the light um, in those days. Um, so again, it's, it's this combination that Stanford White had of of really appreciating the old ways of carving, of hand carving, of beautifully carved wood, uh, which again, he, the pews were all carved according to his standards. And if you get a chance to walk around the pulpit um, carvings, there are beautiful little angels carved all around them as well. Um, but do enjoy looking at these at these cherubim. And I was also intrigued to, to just look at the at this design of this. I never quite understood what was meant by the way this was done with hammer beams and trusses but it's a way to um and i know that there are architects and engineers in this in this audience um it's a way to make a very high arch with shorter pieces of wood where you don't have to have one gigantic piece of wood that spans all of this and right here in the middle is where they all meet um at the highest point of the church um, so, I mean, it's a beautiful design. Now, if you are aware of Stanford White's um, life, um, you will know that the church was built, designed in 1906. He was um, murdered in 1906. So the church had barely begun to be built. Um, we do know that he did do the plans for the church. We actually have the blueprints here. Um, and when he was very uh, shockingly, um, and I think you know the story, he was at Madison Square Garden um, at a party filled with socialites and theater people and and sports people. And Madison Square Garden, the old one that was in Madison Square, he had designed himself. And um, Henry Thaw, 
who was married to Evelyn Nesbitt, came up and shot him dead right in front of all of this party. Um, Stanford White apparently had been having an affair with Evelyn Nesbitt, and that it is a whole other story, which you know, we, we will go into, but it definitely relates to the, to the building of this church, uh, because the only comment uh, that I was able to find was that the murder of the architect will not impede the progress of the church building. Um, so it was it was a story that uh, I think you know filled the press for years, but you know on and on we went. Um, so um, Catherine Mackey, having done that, and I will just digress for a few more moments about Catherine Mackey because I got quite intrigued with her. Um, once she had finished with building Harbor Hill, and she had finished with this, um, she was a woman of. I think obviously very intelligent, um, wasn't given the opportunity as many women in her day were, certainly of her social class, to get much of an education. Um, but she apparently was, she was very curious, intelligent, um, had an ambition to kind of do something more important in life um, and, and a lot of energy, a tremendous amount of energy and a lot of self-confidence. Um, she wrote these um, just really awful letters to Stanford White. And I was thinking when she was, when this church was being built, she was in her mid twenties. Stanford White was 52 and a very well-established architect. And she would write things like, just listen and think. Uh, and most of her, of her comments were directed at design choices or the color of the wood. Um, and she was extremely opinionated. Um, however, having done all this, um, I thought, I mean, I just, you just said, wish you had a window into her mind. Um, she decided she needed something to do besides whatever social life women did, which I guess was go to parties and play bridge and ride horses and, you know, see her children at tea time or something. Um, she began to get very involved in the Roslyn School District and made suggestions to the school board, which they didn't take very kindly to, um, she being a woman, I assume. So she ran for the Roslyn School Board and um, invited everybody to Harbor Hill for tea so they would get to know her. Um, she was, I, I think, a, a gifted politician in her way and um, won a seat on the Roslyn School Board. The first woman, I think, in the whole country um, to have a seat on a school board. Um, and then she tried to make quite a few changes, um, some of which were successful and some were. Um, from then, and it was interesting, I think just sort of reading between the lines, she began to get to know um, different kinds of women from the women of her social class who had been the women that she had known all her life um, and got very curious about what the lives of women in different classes were like and um, got extremely involved in um, the Equal Rights for Women movement, um, women suffragists, and was actually the president of an equal franchise society for a while. So um, a huge shift, I think, from being this sort of just extravagant, flighty, elegant, get dressed up all the time, um, socialite, to doing some very real serious work where she felt she could really make an impact and change things. Um, and then somewhere along 1912, um, her husband Clarence had developed throat cancer and had a Dr. Blake who came to take care of him, who was actually a family friend. Um, somehow Catherine Mackey and Dr. Blake fell in love with each other. And um, the next turn in Mrs. Mackey's story is that she decided to leave um, Clarence Mackey and her three children um, and moved to Paris with Dr. Blake. Uh, World War I had broken out. Um, he was a doctor. He went to um, essentially open, I think, a hospital, take care of soldiers, and she went along with him. Um, she and Clarence were able to get, apparently in France, uh, a no-fault divorce. And with that, she married Dr. Blake, leaving Clarence here with the three children. And that apparently, I mean, you had the whole scandal with Stanford White. I think this was a scandal that apparently went on for many, many years. Um, 
And then I will just finish. It's, it is it is a kind of a, a, a sad story continuing because they were married for a number of years and then she developed cancer. And um, they had hired a young nurse to take care of her. And Dr. Blake then fell in love with a young nurse and married her, leaving Catherine um, you know, um, on her own. At which point, um, Clarence Mackey actually came back into the picture and um, and took care of her um, because she was very ill. Um, and one of her daughters had had, for, had reconciled with her quite a long time ago. So it is, you know, it is just sort of this interesting saga. And I, as I said, I've become quite fascinated with her. Um, so to get back to <laughs> the story of Trinity, um, I was really curious about when they built Harbor Hill at huge expense for those days, um, what, you know, what were they thinking? They were such a young couple. They um, apparently felt that this was this wonderful home house that would be handed down in their family for generations and generations. And their children, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren would all be living there. I mean, little did they know, I thought, let alone the fact that they got divorced. I mean, taxes, everything else. Ultimately, the the stock market crash in 1929 did Clarence Mackey in. Um, so the irony is, is that this sort of afterthought of a church is what remained. Um, and that's, this is what has endured of her legacy um, architecturally, um, which I sort of thought, well, you know, I mean, I'm sure that's not at all what she expected. But aren't we lucky um, that we that we have this? So um, to get back to what she was again to some of the stories about her, I have some photos here which we'll move back so you can see them better later. Uh, but when the church opened, um, these are just some photos. This is actually um, Clarence Mackey and um, one of the and his daughter. I think his daughter Catherine, or maybe uh, there are no pictures of Mrs. Mackey. Um, at this, and I thought it's kind of strange. And then I read somewhere that she was actually pregnant with her youngest child, who was a son, um, John William. And in those days, it was not considered appropriate to photograph women who were pregnant. So that's why there was no, uh, there are no photos of her. Um, another kind of wonderful indication of of her um, of her life and her her context was. Um, this is a photograph of her just on whoops on the um, in the Sunday New York Times. Uh, I assume on a on a front society page. She is with um Consuelo Vanderbilt, who was the Duchess of Marlborough. And they were childhood friends. Um she and Consuelo Vanderbilt had been friends for many, many years. And she had Consuelo Vanderbilt uh, come out here for a church fair in 1907. Uh, to raise money. Apparently the church was rolling in money in those days for the parishioners <laughs> to the point that somebody who died left church for the Presbyterian Methodist churches that said Trinity doesn't need money. Um, <laughs> so um, Consuelo Vanderbilt came and apparently signed postcards for 25 cents each. And I haven't done the math on this, but they made $1,700 from her 25 cent postcards. So they said it was just this enormous group of people just lined up and just masses of people trying to get her autograph. So um, I would say it was, pardon me? It was oh, this is, this is um, Catherine Mackey and this is Consuelo Vanderbilt. And I have some photographs of Catherine Mackey, which I'm gonna put back there. Um, they were sort of a last minute addition to what I was doing in their small but I think you will enjoy looking at them. She was she was absolutely beautiful, a real clothes horse, loved to get dressed up, um, and you know, in, incredibly, incredibly fascinating. So um, this, I think, you know, we owe this church to her. I mean, really, the, the whole building, the fact that it was designed by Stanford White, um, what she had given to the church before, and then, last but not least, um, the Tiffany windows. So um, these windows on this side, which is why I'm glad you're sitting here, um, there's been a lot of back and forth about the Tiffany windows. Um, it's uh, well known, I think, that Stanford White 
and Tiffany were, they were colleagues, they often worked together. Um, they were both bon vivant, they loved the good life, um, loved to have extravagant parties, get dressed up, you know, work moved in very high social circles. Um, we don't have any documented record that Catherine Mackey actually knew her, but I did find somewhere a note that Catherine Mackey said to Stanford White, let's go out and see Tiffany and get him to do some windows. I, thought, I wouldn't put it past her, knowing, knowing the way she operated. Um, so in any case, um, these windows, don't, the one on the left, which happens to not be my personal favorite, is the only one that's assigned window. It's a late one, uh, 1920s. Um, the two on the right, uh, to me, are much more beautiful. And uh, the one up above, also, um, to me, look much more like Tiffany windows. And there was a, um, an article written in the New York Times some years ago, uh, quoting a book, and some of you in the Landmark Society may know it, by a couple of names, Skindia, who did a whole census of uh, Tiffany windows on Long Island. And they did determine that, yes, these windows do did come from the Tiffany studios. Uh, and I think to me, what's interesting about Tiffany windows is, um, you know, you have this idea, Tiffany is an artist, he's making all these windows. He did not. Um, he came up with a very different way of making stained glass windows. Um, I pointed out to you when you were in the back that um, those windows from a previous era were painted on. Um, Tiffany wasn't happy with the way light came through windows. And um, I, I also find the whole idea of stained glass in churches kind of fascinating. It always, I always thought, why do churches have, why do churches have stained glass and not real glass? And I have been in churches um, where there is real glass. And depending on what you're looking at, it's sort of nice. But I think, I mean, part of it, there's sort of two reasons. Um, one is that it sort of puts you in a different, in a different place. You don't feel as if you're really in the world anymore. I mean, light is coming through, but um, it's not realistic light. You're not looking outside it, nor the boulevard or trees or seeing people move around. So it puts you in a different, I think, sort of spiritual realm. And of course, originally, uh, when stained glass was first made in the Middle Ages uh, for churches, it told a story. Um, this was for pre-literate people. Um, this was the way Bible stories were, were told, was through was through the stories of, in, the, in the stained glass. Um, what Tiffany did, and we've had an exhibition at the Nassau County Museum, where I've worked for many years. We have a number of Tiffany watercolors. Um, many of which he did when he was traveling in the Middle East, in Egypt particularly. And um, I read at the time that he was so dissatisfied with the way he could capture that light in watercolor or in oil paint, that he thought there has to be a different way to capture that kind of brilliant light. And he turned to stained glass. Um, and clearly, a pane of glass with glass with paint on it was not going to do it for him. Um, so he began to experiment, looked at very old ways of making glass. He went back to Roman glass, um, how the glass was actually dyed um, or or was the color was actually in the glass. It wasn't painted on top of the glass. And he developed a whole new way of creating stained glass. So this glass is not one layer of glass. It is multiple layers. And we used to be able to open these windows, which was just an amazing experience. Um, they now have hurricane protection on the outside, so we can't do it so easily. But if you open them, you realize that they are actually about this thick. And there are different layers, literally different layers of glass in them. And the Tiffany, Tiffany Studios, one of, I think, the genius of Tiffany was that he developed ways of coloring the glass, um, creating, and when you, I, I'm going to ask you to, to move up and walk around in a few moments, um, creating different textures in the glass. 
So there's glass that is sort of drapery glass. There's glass that's rippled. There's glass that's sort of pebbled. There's glass that's modeled. Um, and then they would layer them. It would be like an artist having a palette, but it would be pieces of glass. And the artists who were creating the glass um, would know exactly where to lay one over the other. So the leading, which outlines the figures and the landscape, sort of holds the whole thing in, in place. But the glass, if you look at the glass, the glass is very abstract. And it creates the, it's the, the combination of all of it that actually creates a recognizable image. But if you just look at those individual sections of glass, I mean, there's nothing realistic about them. It's just beautiful pieces of glass. And I'm very pleased that the sun came out. And, um, and I will encourage you to come back even later because as the sun sets behind these windows, um, these windows get more and more brilliant as we move around. So um, what I think we'll do is if I can ask Lisa to turn up the lights, um, they're really beautiful with the lights out. And um, while we wait for her to do that, if anyone has any questions um, about the glass or anything else, yes, please. I can oh. help myself. And it says that the churches of the 10th, 11th, 12th century dealt with illiterate, mostly illiterate people in church. So the idea was that windows would tell the story. Different. The, 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 the theology. Not so much theology, but stories from the Bible. The Bible. So, for instance, and and I am always, I mean, I love, I've been very fortunate to spend um, time traveling in Europe, and I love to go into the churches and see not only the stained glass, but in many of the churches, the capitals around the column also tell stories. So, in this one, I'm glad you asked the question, Greg, um, because the one on the right is Jacob's dream, um, which is um, part in the uh, part of the of the Old Testament. Um, and it is is Jacob who fell asleep and had a dream, and angels came to give a message from God. The middle one is Moses viewing the promised land. So this is Moses who has finally gotten through his travails and has found the promised land. The one on the left is Jesus. Um, and I'm sorry, it's called Jesus the Good Samaritan, but it looks to me like Jesus and the woman at the well. So there's a definitely some confusion. Um, and then at the back, they're all saints. So, you yeah, know, so these, you know, I mean, for us in, in our era, some of these stories, particularly Jacob's dream, is probably a little obscure. Um, but, um, you know, if you were if you were trying to tell to get people to understand these stories, um, it would be a way for people to visually look at look at the windows and be able to sort of grasp the meaning. Um, which I always thought of the lady. Yeah, so please stand up and go. Your story to me. Hmm? The middle window is probably on the far. Are there um, two side windows? The, so the side windows were. were uh, 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 and they made the last. Who knows? But I, the, they were all attributed to something called the Church the Church Glass and Decorating Company. There's very little information on this Church Glass and Decorating Company, other than to say that many of the churches that have glass stained glass made by this company also have Tiffany windows in them. So uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it, as I said, it's it's definitely a topic for a PhD thesis, and we've had many people come in and say they have never seen a window that depicted God. I mean, I think it's a very, and so this is, you know, this is literally the, the beginning of the Bible where God is creating light, you know, day and, you know, day, night. Uh, it's the cre it's a creation window. And the other two are just sort of celestial windows with, you know, stars and, and moon in them. And we have occasionally had um, a spotlight put behind that window so that it really uh, becomes illuminated too, which is really beautiful. Um, so please wander over that way. Um, take a look. I will come over with you.
Take a look at the carvings on the pulpit while you come. Yeah. So I think if you get if you get up close, um, you can see the different textures um, in the glass, and you can begin to see all the different colors um, and the different layers. So the faces are painted um, with a piece of translucent glass that comes over the over them. Um, and as I said, as the the sun hits behind these windows, you can see this little bit of orange on the on the top of this angel's robe. Um, all of these little bits of orange and the orange and the green and the wings just begin to absolutely glow. I mean, it's just amazing to sit here and watch the sun sort of move behind the windows. It's like watching a, a movie or something. You know? just, and unfortunately, as I said, because they face west, um, if we're in church on Sunday morning, you know, we never see it. So it's just, a, it's really, it's always a treat to be here the late afternoon. And to see and have the sun come up. Um, so it is it is it, you know, kind of extraordinary. Um the, the the Moses window does much the same thing, and you can see the different kinds of glass, um, all the different the different textures, the different patterns um in that one as well. But do you, do you know uh, the process of staining what it means, how it's done? Well, do you know you know about glass blowing? Okay, so it's a chemical process. When you put different color chemicals into the mixture, the sand mixture, so it's a essentially a chemical process of of coloring the glass, like any kind of colored glass. If you you know glass made of the green glass wine bottle, for instance, um, it's just a matter of putting different chemicals, um, different pigments into the the mixture, the the liquid mixture uh, that you're going to make the glass from. So the Tiffany Studios. Sheets and sheets of, of different colored glass, and then while the glass was cooling, um, I mean, it wasn't they weren't blowing glass, uh, but they were actually making sheets of glass. While the glass was cooling, um, they could do like pull things through it to make what they call drapery glass, um, or put something on it to make the ripples or the model defect, and sometimes they would throw different pieces, other pieces of copper glass into it um, to make it sort of I think what they call confetti glass. If you look, I don't want to lean too much of it, it's like so fun doing it. So if you look way out there, see that the cross is actually made with very three-dimensional, um, almost chunks of, of glass, um, which again is very characteristic of, of an illustrated. I mean, you can see it's really innovative. Um, or as I said, I think Tiffany gave credit to genius of Tiffany for doing it. While he, in fact, by now I never actually made a window. So um, it was it was it was his idea. Um, he designed it. He had the people to carry through and did it. Um, so I think when people say, oh, you know, did Tiffany make this window? I don't think he actually made any windows. <laughs> But, but they are Tiffany windows because without them, um, this whole method of creating stained glass, I mean, somebody probably would have come along at some point. But I mean, he was, this to me is his genius, is that he was able to figure this to just, you know, with a lot of experimentation, a lot of back and forth. I mean, it's not not done in a day by any means. And I think there were a lot of accidents along the way. And then of course, you know, his, his lamps are the same, the same idea. Um, I think a lot more accessible people see them. Um, they were, I think, you know, for many years, people didn't want anything to do with Tiffany lamps. They were considered to be very stuffy and Victorian. Um, I've had several people tell me stories of, oh, you know, my, my great aunt had a Tiffany lamp that she wanted to give me. And I said, I don't want that. It was great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and now, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just, you know, it's a fascinating story. And, t and the Tiffany Studios produced. I mean, hundreds, thousands of windows. They're all over the country. Um, now, if you um, all have the energy, what I'd like to do is walk up to the parish hall so that you get the, sort of the full picture of that. And we have some beautiful windows in there, um, which were designed by a woman. Yeah, Tiffany didn't always even do the design of the windows. She had a large number of women who worked here, were extremely unknown for many years. 
um, only met on the beginning to be recognized, um, who actually designed the windows and did the work on them. Did those, you know, women's hands are better at manipulating small pieces of glass. Um, so the windows in the parish hall were commissioned by Catherine Mackey for that building. And her three children were models for them. So they're very unusual windows. Um, in fact, when this couple Spinzios came around, they said they looked at the faces and they thought, we've never seen faces, anything like these on, on any stained glass. And so if you're if you're willing, we'll walk up that way and I'll tell you the story when we get there. I take a look at these as you as you yes, look at the camera because they really are quite beautiful. Uh, oh, close and look along your way. Come up close and look at the windows. Absolutely beautiful, sir. I mean, you can really see see the ripple glass in here, um, different all the different effects of the glass if you're you know, right up close to this. Well, yeah. Okay. And then I would suggest just move back a little bit so that you can see the whole the whole uh, context of the. Yeah. You know, I'll let you come up. It's just it's such a treat to see those from close. So. Um, these windows, the parish hall, when we go back outside, it was it was so noisy out there. I thought, I'm not going to try to talk. And I'm going to ask you to just stand back a little bit and look at the whole complex um, because it's a beautifully designed uh, small brick structure, um, the way it's shaped with the two porches that sort of meet each other. And the original Stanford White is the... There's a the small room right there that we walked through, the hallway. To the right, you can peek in, is now our rector's office, um, which is a beautifully proportioned room uh, with a beam ceiling and a fireplace. Um, so when you walk outside, as I said, we in the church, we come in through the inside. We never look at it from the outside, but it's really a delightful, delightfully built small building. And then the cloistered uh, passageway that Catherine Mackey discussed we did walk sort of through and uh, and past um, that um, has now been glassed in. But you will see the whole thing as we go back out that way. So these windows were originally in that room back there. Um, to make a very long story short, um, this room was added on. It had a, a very low ceiling. And somewhere in the 1990s, this barrel vault was, was created here. Um, these windows had been moved up here um, originally when that room was uh, done. It's a terrible place for them because it faces it right in. I mean, there's a hillside right here. So they get very little light, except um, our caretaker who lives here told me when it snows, um, when it snows, he said they just get brilliant because the, the, the when the sun hits at the snow, the reflection comes through here. And he said it's just it's just absolutely beautiful. So um, these were the windows of the Spinzios when they came. So they had never seen anything, any faces quite like these. And, you know, it was a bit of a mystery in the church until a number of years ago. Um, 
the priest that we had at the time said, a gentleman showed up <laughs> and said he wanted to see these windows in particular, um, which are not in the church. So, you know, it's hard for people to see them unless they're a member of the church. So he brought them, brought this gentleman back here and this man stood here and just had tears coming down his face. And it turned out that he was John Mackey, the son of Clarence and Catherine. And he knew that his mother had had him and his two sisters pose for this window. Um, so it's, I mean, it's one of these, you know, lovely stories. Um, his his um, widow, who was a, a very down-to-earth person, came a number of years later and stood here and said, that story's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> but, but again, I mean, it's, you know, the, 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 the faces are very unusual. Um, these were designed by a woman named Clara Bird, who was also um, an illustrator. She did a lot of children's book illustrations. And I was looking at some of them and I thought her children's book illustrations look exactly like stained glass. They have this kind of very thick um, black outlines. I mean, they're beautiful illustrations in that sort of, you know, early uh, 19th century way. Um, but it's it's a love and they're they're actually beautiful windows and these are earlier also they were done around 19 1906 or so um so i have a couple of questions about clarence and catherine um somebody said if um john mackey was irish wasn't he irish catholic yes indeed so um clarence was always interested in saint mary's contributed a lot of money to saint mary's even though they were divorced um he and Catherine were divorced. He had a lady friend who was a well-known opera singer for many years, never married her until Catherine died, uh, being a good Catholic. Uh, and as far as I know, the children were, I think, raised, I don't know, sort of in between. Um, I think one of them was married at St. Mary's. Um, the One of them, Ellen, I mean, many of you know the story, married Irving Berlin. Uh, yeah, which, which, you know, which was not looked on very kindly by her, her fancy, uh, her fancy father. Uh, but her mother, I think, who had been through her own scandals, um, apparently was very supportive. And um, so it's, I mean, the whole family to me is, is, you know, as you can tell, I'm quite intrigued with them. Um, so, yeah, so that was the story was that um, he, uh, Clarence Mackey, was very supportive of St. Mary's while Catherine um, was supportive of Trinity. But as you can see in that picture, they obviously sort of went back and forth um, between the between the two. Um, so we will, I think we will finish here unless you have any more questions. Oh, somebody did ask me what happened to Harbor Hill. So Harbor Hill, um, they, they, Clarence lived there with um, his second wife, Anna, uh, for a number of years. Stock market crash in 1929, just about wiped him out. He made some very bad investments and they sort of limped along for a while. Uh, but finally, after he died, they just couldn't keep it up. So um, it was sold and turned down. And I can remember discussing this with a friend who was here from, from Europe. And she said that was built in 1900, mm -hmm. torn down in 1947. I mean, this house that cost six million dollars in 1900, and I said, mm -hmm. and she looked at me and she said, "How American!" <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, and I mean, I wrote a couple of articles that said, "Couldn't it have been the house somehow been saved? Couldn't somebody?" I think, unfortunately, the Garys were around then, right? <laughs> or they might have done. They might have been able to do something, even advocating for it. Um, so it is, I mean, it is to me a very sad story. Um, luckily, there are, I mean, again, if you live in Roslyn and are a member of the Landmark Society, you do know that the Landmark Society is restoring uh, the gatehouse, which is left. Um, there were two wonderful horses um, that were on big pedestals in front of the house. Uh, one of them was moved to Gary Park, which had been in a private home. And the other one, I believe, it's still in front of Roslyn High School. Yes. And the land, again, the land for the high school was given to the high school by the Mackeys. That was part of their property. 
Um, Harbor Hill School, too. I mean, that property went from, you know, where Glen Cove, beyond Glen Cove Road, basically almost all the way down to the harbor, at least up to the, you know, up to the village. Uh, and from here, I think all the way over into East Hills. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it's just incredible to think of how huge that property was. Um, yes. Yes, there's a, there's, um, the gates are on uh, Roslyn Road, right? Yeah, Roslyn Road. Um, and depending on which way you're driving, um, if you're going that way, south, it's kind of hard to see. If you're coming this way, they're much easier to see. And they are being restored by the Landmark Society, I think. So they were at the... Uh, yeah. Uh, I would call Nick. Yes. He had both a Vanderbilt Cup raising. Yes. But he also had the uh, newsletter with the uh, uh And there are pictures of now that right. Bob was being made. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, in the back is nice homes in the back. Right. The back in the day, went all the way. All the way, all the way over there. there. Yeah. So he had on his website, the Bobber and Wormhoff website. Yeah. Website. You'll see, you'll see both. Yeah. yeah, you'll see both. Yeah. I think I first was aware of how huge that property was many years ago when um, my son was elementary school. He had a friend whose father picked him up and we were just discussing, I don't know, local history or neighborhoods. And he said, oh, he said, I grew up in a house right where, you know, where the Wendy's is at the corner of Northern Boulevard and Glen Cove Road. Yeah. I said, what are you doing living there? And he said, my father worked on the Mackey property. And I said, it went all the way there. I mean, I had no idea. He said, oh, yeah, it went even beyond there. Um, so, yeah, it was just, you know, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's just a, a you know, to me, that one of these amazing tales of sort of, you know, riches to rags to riches back to rags. Um, and I believe Irving Berlin actually sort of bailed them out um, in the end after they had lost all their money. Um, and they finally reconciled. So it's a, a story that goes on and on. I would encourage you to go back down for, take a look at the building as you leave. Um, go back down. We have refreshments at the back of the church and go take another look at the windows as the sun goes down. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.